Hey guys, so this is the NCLEX RN 2018 Comprehensive Review Series. So this is Section 5, which is on Fundamentals in Nursing. Section 1, Client Safety. So the nurse is responsible to implement action to reduce the risk of falling. There is an increased risk of falling in these following patients. Older adults, impaired mobility, cognitive and sensory impairment, bowel and bladder dysfunction, people on certain medications that cause like sedation, orthostatic hypertension, and patients with a history of falls. So these are interventions that you want to do. You want to do a full risk assessment when they come in. You want to tell the healthcare team if they are at risk for falls. You want to assign the patient to the room closest to the nurse's station to give them non-skip footwear, no clutter so they don't trip over anything. You want to orient them to their setting, show them the call bell and how to use it, and show them the grab bars in the shower. And you want to place the bed in the lowest position. You want to have adequate lighting, assistive devices like canes and walkers should be within reach. You want to lock their wheelchair, and if there's a bed sensor, that will help you. Injuries. Restraints. So these include human restraints, mechanical restraints, chemical restraints, or physical restraints. So basically, anything that restricts the freedom or freedom of a patient is considered a restraint. So what you want to do is that you always want to do the least restrictive way to protect the patient and others first. You're going to try to distract them observe them, use diversional activities, anything else but to restrain them. If you have to restrain them, then you want to tell the healthcare provider as soon as you restrain them. You want to assess the neurovascular status every two hours. You want to leave it loose enough so that there's no injuries, but tight enough so that it restrains them. You want to tie the restraints to the bed frame. There's a max of 24 hours that a patient could be under the restraint. So you want to document everything, and it should never interfere with treatment, and it should never be used as a punishment or a convenience. Caesar Picosum. They want to have rescue equipment at bedside. This includes oxygen, oral airways, and suction equipment. If the patient's high risk, you want to establish an IV or saline bath. You want to remove unnecessary items from immediate environment. You want to help the patient to the floor and protect the patient's head. If the patient's in bed, you want to raise the side rails and pad for safety. You want to roll the patient to the side with head flexed slightly forward. Never put anything in the patient's mouth. You want to loosen restrictive clothing and document everything, like the time and what happened, etc. Section 2, Environmental Safety. So fire, here are the mnemonics, race and pass. So race stands for rescue, alarm, contain, and extinguish. So you want to rescue, like the patients who are in immediate danger, you want to alarm, that means you want to activate the alarm, and you want to contain, so you want to close the doors or the windows, and you want to extinguish, so you want to use a proper extinguisher. So now, to use the extinguisher, you want to use the mnemonics PASS, which means pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. So that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to pull it, you're going to aim it, you're going to squeeze it, and then you're going to sweep it. Some other stuff you should know, you want to use a stop, drop, and roll. Everything else is kind of self-explanatory, you know, like don't overcrowd outlets, etc. You know, like it's not going to be tested on the NCLEX. All you should just know is the mnemonics race and pass for the NCLEX. Then chemical and radioactive agents, so these are kind of simple. Also, um, you want to put a sign on the door, you want to wear protective equipment, and you never want to handle with your hands. Section 3, ergonomics and client positioning. When lifting and transferring patients, you want to assess your own strength first. Then you want to ask the patient to help whatever they could. You want to use mechanical lifts and assistive devices. You do not want to twist your thoracic spine or bend at the waist. Instead, you want to use major muscle groups and tighten your abdominal muscles. When you're moving from a bed to chair, you want to lower the bed to the lowest position possible, and you should move the patient on their stronger side and pivot yourself. When you're positioning in bed, you want to raise the bed to your waist level. You want to lower the side rails. Use a slide board or draw sheet, whatever you have, and the patient should fold the arm around the chest and lift their head off the bed, and you want to move them in one movement and ask for assistance. So here are positions. So the NCLEX likes to ask on this because they'll give you an example of a patient and ask you which position should they pl be placed in, or they'll give you select or that apply, or the patient has a spinal injury, which position sh should the patient be placed in, or something like that. Okay, so I'm going to start with high failures. High failures is 60 to 90 degrees. It's kind of like sitting up. So it's for patients who want to eat or watch TV, and it allows the maximum expansion of the chest. It's good for breathing, etc. I think the semi fowlers semi is 30 to 45 degrees. It's for chest expansion. Then go supine. Supine is basically straight on the back with no pillow. So that you would do after lumbar puncture or for spinal injury. Then you have semi recumbent, which is supine, so it's flat on the back, but it has pillows. So this is after an abdominal surgery or abdominal dissension. Then goes prone. Prone's on the stomach. It's to relieve pressure off the back or someone has a burn on their back or it's to help them sleep. 
then goes lateral, also called sideline and sims. It's on the side with the upper legs flexed and arms in forward. It's to relieve pressure on the back, head, and butt. Or to promote drainage of saliva secretions, like if someone's going to have a seizure, you want to place them on the side so they don't ask for the secretions. Or to examine the rectal or perennial area, like if you want to give an enema. And then goes dorsal. So dorsal is on the back with the knees flexed on the bed. So that's for GYN or if you're inserting a urine catheter, then goes lithomy. So lithomy is on the back with your feet in 90 degrees in stirrups. So this is basically in labor or GYN appointments. Then goes Vandelberg, so that's like on an operating room. So instead of raising the head of bed, they would be raising your feet up. So this is for shock or for pelvic or rectal exam. Section four, assistive devices for ambulation. So first is general information. You want to have non slip socks. You want to assess for risk for orthostatic hypertension. You want to remove old clutter from the room. You want to have rubber tips on the devices and you want to have physical therapist consultation. So now for the crutches. So you want it to be a good fit. Now there should be at least three finger width between the axilla and top of the crutch. You want the hands on hand grip with elbows flexed 30 degrees, and you do not want to bear weight on the axilla. Now, there's different type of crutches. The first one is a non-weight bearing, the second one is a weight bearing. So, non-weight bearing is a three-point gait, which means that the patient cannot place an affected leg down. The way you're going to walk is that both crutches are going to move with the affected leg, and then you're going to move the unaffected leg. It's kind of like hopping on the unaffected leg. So, you're going to move both the crutches with the affected leg, and then you're going to move the unaffected leg. Then goes weight bearing, so this could be a two or four point gait. So it's kind of like a march or a walk. You're going to move the crutch in one step, then the affected leg, then the unaffected leg. Walking up and down the stairs. You should remember, up with the good, down with the bad. So to go up the stairs, you're going to hold on the rail with one hand and the crutches with the other hand. And then you're going to go up with your good foot. You're going to bring your bad foot with it. To go down, you're going to put your crutches in the bad leg down, and then you're going to have your good leg. So remember, up with the good, down with the bad. So now we're just going to continue with canes and walkers. Cane you always want to have on the stronger side. So as you can see on the side, there's a mnemonic. Cole, cane opposite affected leg. So you always want to have it on the stronger side. You want to have a measure with the shoes on. And when you're actually moving, you want to move the cane forward 6 to 10 inches, then the weaker leg, then the stronger leg. So with walkers, you also want to have your shoes on for sizing. You want to move the walker forward 12 inches, then affected leg, then unaffected leg. Section 5, Infection Control. So the chain of infection, all you have to know is that it starts from an agent, a microorganism, and then there's a mode of transmission of how it gets to somewhere else. It goes on a susceptible person, example, immunosuppressed person, and then it could lead from that person to other people. So it's, so it's a never-ending cycle, everyone can catch it, which is why you need infection control. Now we're going to discuss medical asepsis versus surgical asepsis. So medical asepsis is clean technique. Surgical asepsis is sterile technique. So clean technique, the goal is to reduce the amount and the growth of the microorganism. It's not to eliminate it. That's surgical asepsis. So medical asepsis, it includes hand washing, personal protective equipment. You don't want to place items on the floor. You don't want to shake the linen. You want to clean the least soils first. You want to place moist items in a plastic bag, and you want to educate the patient. Then surgical asepsis. So I would know surgical asepsis. So that's called sterile technique. You don't want to cough, talk, or sneeze directly over the field. You only want to use dry sterile items to touch the field. And the one inch border on the outside is not sterile. All the objects are above the waist and within vision. So you don't want to turn your back to a sterile field. You want to wash your hands and wear sterile gloves. Surgical asepsis is be used in the OR. You also want to use sterile technique when you're doing um, central venous catheter or something that's going to go in the patient. Isolation guidelines. So first of all, you can use these for everyone. A side point, you want to report communicable diseases. You want to handle all fluids as if contaminated. You want to use gown and gloves when touching fluids, non-intact skin, contaminated material. And you want to use mask or something for the face when you anticipate splashing, like you could, if you're suctioning or blood's going to come out. And you want to dispose of the personal protective equipment in the patient's room. So now let's go into specifics. Okay, standard precautions are used for everyone. They're used for all body fluids, non-intact skin, and mucous membranes. So then goes transmission-based precautions. So these are used in addition to standard precautions. So you can use standard precautions plus these. These include airborne, droplet, and contact. Airborne is transmitted by the ear. It's for less than 5 mcgs. It stays in the ear. That's what you have to remember. It stays in the ear. So it's even if you're not directly in front of the patient, you could still get it. Included in that is TB, tuberculosis. So for specifically tuberculosis, you're going to be wearing an N95 respirator. For all the other ear ones, you're going to have negative airflow and the door closed. And remember, if you're transporting the patient, then the patient's going to have to wear a mask. 
For, neg for negative ear flow, they like to use HEPA filter. Then goes droplet, which is also transmitted by ear, but it's for more than 5 mcg, but it does not stay in ear. So you're only going to catch it if you're within 3 feet from the patient. So what you want to do is you want to wear a mask when you're within 3 feet from the patient, and you want to have the door closed. Then goes contact precaution. So contact is when you're in direct or indirect contact with the patient. It would be for like a wound drainage, fecal incontinence, and bodily discharge. You're going to wear the gowns and gloves. So other stuff you should know, you want to load the dressing material in non-porous bag. You want to have specific equipment for the patient and disinfect it after each use and do not bring it out of the room. And the patient should only leave the room for specific reasons. And to remember airborne versus droplet is that ear, it's gonna stay in the ear, and droplet, it's a drop. So like think about a drop of water, it's not gonna flow to the other room, you know? But earborne, something in the ear could go to the other room. So here are some infectious diseases that you need to report to the CDC. HIV, varicella, which is chicken pack, hepatitis A, B, and C, the measles, which is rubiola, rubella, salmonella, shingles, tuberculosis, vancomycin resistant, and cacti. So here are the sequence of putting on and taking off personal protective equipment. NCLEX likes to test them. Put on, you're going to do the gown, mask, face, and then gloves. And to remove, you're going to do the glove, face, gown, and mask. The way I remember this, so let's say you're getting ready for a wedding. You would put on your gown first, then if you put on your makeup first, and then you put on your gown, it would smear up all the makeup. So you, so you put on your gown first, and then you're going to do your mask, so like your foundation and stuff like that. And then you're going to do your face, so your eyeliner after that. And then you're going to put your gloves on and go outside. To remove it, a way to remember that, gloves go first. So love. So once you went to wedding and now you're married, now you're love. So gloves first. And then goes goggles, then the gown, and then the mask. So here are diseases that are either airborne, droplet, or contact. So these I would know. You don't have to memorize all them. So for airborne, tuberculosis, measles, varicella, herpes zoster. For droplet, meningococcal, pneumonia, RSV, rubella, pertussis, mumps, scarlet fever, and strep. For contact, varicella, C. diff, herpes simplex, herpes zoster, MRSA, RSV, rotavirus, salmonella, shingles, staph aureus, and VRE. So first of all, you should know that a few of them are actually considered both. So let's say I bolded them. So RSV is both droplet and contact, and varicella is both airborne and contact, and herpes zoster is both airborne and contact also. You should also just know that varicella is chickenpox, measles is rubiola, and herpes zoster is shingles. I would know the airborne because I like to test on that, so a hint to remember that is TMV. I wouldn't necessarily know herpes zoster because I like to ask for tuberculosis, measles, and varicella. So think TMV, too much videos, because that's a problem nowadays. TMV, too much videos. So for a droplet, if they give you something and it's not an airborne, and you're thinking if it's airborne or droplet, then it's probably a droplet. Then for contact, so if you actually think about what the disease is, it's very easy. Something like, it's all the stuff that would come with fecal incontinence or diarrhea or something like that, that if you touch it, it could spread. Like rotavirus, MRSA, C. diff, all the stuff that you would think. Section 6, Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. Health promotion includes educating the patient, risk assessment, lifestyle and behavior changes, environmental control programs. Three levels of prevention. Primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is promoting health and preventing disease. So examples are immunization, car seat education, nutrition and fitness activities, and education programs. Secondary prevention is early identification of an illness and treatment of it. Really anything to do to prevent worsening of health, like screening, early detection and treatment, exercise for older adults who are frail. Then goes tertiary prevention. That's preventing the long-term consequences of chronic illness and supporting optimal function. So this includes preventing pressure ulcers on someone who's on their back all day, promoting independence for a patient with stroke, screening guidelines. So here are just a few of them. Colorectal cancer, you're going to start at age 50. Pap smear test, you're going to start at age 21. Mammogram, you're going to start at age 40. Testicular exam, you're going to start at age 15. If there's any risk factor or the mother has it or something, they might have to start before. So I know, so for the full risk assessment, you're going to use the Morse oral scale. Okay, so that's the end for this chapter. So next we're going to go on to part six, which is med search. Please like and subscribe.